Thank you, Jamil Muhammad, for that uh, introduction to our uh, esteemed panelists, uh, Rabbi Fair, uh, Pastor Ward, uh, to our uh, missionary, Molana Irshad Mali, and to all of our uh, dear guests who have joined, uh, many familiar faces I see here. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Greetings of peace to all of you. I extend a, a warm welcome to all of you who've joined this Interfaith Iftar program virtually. We are nearing completion of the holy month of Ramadan, a time of intense prayers, self-reflection, and sacrifice for millions of Muslims all over the world. And we gather here this evening to share the blessings of this month with our brothers and sisters of different faiths and cultural traditions. As Jamil Saab had mentioned in his introductory remarks, during Ramadan, we refrain from food or drink from before sunrise to sunset huh? and bear the physical burdens that accompany that. But the more challenging burden is the one to improve our inner moral core, a spiritual climb to be closer to Allah by being just and virtuous. This is the climb that should consume every Muslim in the world, a journey towards inner and outer peace. And in the Quran, the holy book of Islam, Allah provides a very specific path for a Muslim to take this sublime spiritual climb. And that is reflected in one of the verses recited in the beginning of today's program. Quote, and when my servants ask thee about me say, I am near. I answer the prayer of the supplicant when he prays. In Islam, offering prayers is not only God's command. It is the primary tool with which an individual can uplift society. Indeed, Muslims serve others by harnessing the transformative power of prayer. Today, we title our theme, A Time of national healing through prayer. As we gather virtually during this global pandemic, we remember the families and loved ones of the over 575,000 Americans who have died from COVID-19 and the over 3 million people who have died globally. Words can't quite capture the emotions in the wake of such incalculable human loss. As American Muslims, we share in grieving over the departed souls who were part of our American family. Not only must we as a nation heal from the toll inflicted by a global pandemic, the likes of which we have not seen in more than a century, we must also heal from what are undoubtedly other moral failings that are equally ravaging our country. We are deeply and bitterly divided as a nation. And earlier this year, we witnessed an unprecedented attack on the seat of our democracy on Capitol Hill. The alarming uptick in racist and hate-filled attacks against Black Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and so many other groups hearkens to a grim era when we stood on the brink of a civil war. And we worry whether we stand on the brink of another one now. In such perilous times, a gathering virtually such as this one provides a golden opportunity to examine how our collective faiths in a living God and the power of prayer can repair the cracks in our nation's foundation. Today, during these final days of Ramadan, 
I wish to reflect on just three aspects of Islam's teaching that are magnified by the power of prayers and that may help achieve healing in our nation. First, unrelenting service to others. Second, unequivocal embrace of human equality and rejection of racism. And finally, unconditional forgiveness of others. Let me turn first to service to others. The Quran provides a very clear blueprint for a Muslim's spiritual climb. And that blueprint is in the selfless service of others. In chapter 90 of the Quran, a chapter entitled Al-Balad, or the city, verses 10 through 16, we read, and we have pointed out to man the two highways of good and evil, but he attempted not the steep climb courageously. And what should make you know what the steep climb is? It is the freeing of a slave or feeding in a day of severe hunger an orphan near of kin or a poor man lying in the dust. These beautiful verses are worth close analysis. This chapter of the Quran al-Balad was revealed to the prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, in the first few years of his claim to prophethood. He was perhaps 41 or 42 years of age when Allah revealed this chapter. During these years, Muhammad, peace be upon him, endured severe persecution, even in his, in his own home city of Mecca, among those in the Quraysh who knew him, facing the depths of despair, when all hope seemed lost, Allah revealed these verses as a clear reminder that only in service of those who are less fortunate can a Muslim climb courageously towards the highway of good. The Quran here speaks of specific segments of society at the time. The slaves who toiled away from their families, the laborers who endured severe hunger, the orphans who would be neglected by others, and those who lay in the extreme depths of poverty. The Arabic words in, in, in this chapter are za matraba, matraba, those who are lying in the dust, those who are invisible in society. How fitting that these verses would be revealed to the prophet of Islam, who himself was an orphan, who would spend so much of his time in the company of those who were extremely poor. His heart was full of love for his fellow human beings, and he had a special reverence for those who had nothing, for those who had been forgotten or cast off by society, be it the slaves, the widows, the orphans, the poor, the blind, the distressed, the prophet of Islam felt their pain and prayed for ease of their anguish. This intense sympathy for humankind is the hallmark of a Muslim's purpose in this life. And it is one we reflect on intently as we fast today. As Muslims, we cannot begin to heal as a nation if we do not hear the cries of those who are homeless, of those who are hungry and alone on the streets of our cities, on the streets of our counties. It is for this reason that the international spiritual leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmad, while visiting the United States in 2018, spoke about the inextricable link between spirituality and service. Reflecting on Islam's true teachings, he said, in times of grief and despair, we will always be there to wipe away the tears of our neighbors and to support and comfort them. The second aspect of Islam's teachings that I wish to reflect on this evening is the unequivocal embrace of human equality and the rejection of racism. Again, we read in the Quran a clear recognition of equality for all human beings in the eyes of God. In chapter 49, verse 13, a verse that was alluded to by our dear rabbi, Allah says, O oh, humankind, we made you into nations and tribes 
so that you may get to know one another. The noblest of you in Allah's sight is the most righteous among you. This very verse challenged many of the values of pre-Islamic Arab society, where inequalities based on tribal membership, kinship, and wealth were a fact of life. One's kinship or lineal descent was the primary determinant of an individual's social status. Members of larger, more prominent tribes, like the aristocratic Quraysh, were powerful. Those from far less wealthy tribes had lower standing. But this Quranic verse upended that mentality and noted that personal piety and deeds were the basis for merit, not tribal affiliation. When the Quraysh learned of this message, they had no intention of giving up their wealth and status, which were built largely on the backs of African slaves. But the Prophet Muhammad wasallam's message of egalitarianism attracted so many people from all walks of life, including the undesirables, the so-called undesirables in society, including non-Arabs who had little standing. These included Salman, the Persian, Choab, the Roman, and Bilal, the Ethiopian slave. All three of these people rose up in prominence during the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's life. The story of Bilal is perhaps the most famous. He was persecuted by his owner Umayyah for embracing Islam, and as a slave, he was later set free. The Prophet of Islam did not simply champion the rights of oppressed racial and ethnic minorities. He empowered them to lead others. And for Bilal in particular, the Prophet of Islam appointed him the first person to give the public call for prayer. We call it the Azan because of his personal piety. Today, over 1.8 billion Muslims recognize that call for prayer before every congregational prayer five times a day all over the world from Bangkok to Berlin. Indeed, the momentous address which the Prophet of Islam delivered shortly before he passed away after the performance of what has come to be known as the final sermon, the farewell sermon. This is an epitome of the entire spirit of the teachings of Islam and it, as it relates to equality. In the course of this address, he had this to say, O oh men, what I say to you, you must hear and remember. All Muslims are as brethren to one another. All of you are equal, all men, whatever nation or tribe they may belong to and whatever station in life they may hold are equal, even as the fingers of the two hands are equal, so are human beings equal to one another. You are as brothers, oh man, your God is one, your ancestor is one, an Arab possesses no superiority over a non-Arab, nor does a non-Arab over an Arab. A white man is in no way superior to a black man nor for that matter is a black man superior to a white man, only to the extent to which they discharge their duties to God and man. The most honored among you in the sight of God is the most righteous among you. This beautiful, timeless message was a healing one for a society that had been ripped apart, ripped apart by racial and ethnic tensions, the very same tensions that we see in American society today. But it was that message 1,500 years ago, that elixir, that antidote, that message of anti-racism championed by the founder of Islam. This is a very important message. These are the words of healing that we can use in our own country. The final aspect that I wish to cover tonight is the unconditional forgiveness of others. Again, we read in the Holy Quran, chapter 3, verse 160, and it is by the great mercy of Allah that you are kind towards them. And if you, the prophet of Islam, had been rough and hard-hearted, they would surely have dispersed from around thee. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them and consult them in matters of administration. And when you are determined, then put trust in Allah, for surely Allah loves those who put their trust in him. In the face of extreme persecution, the prophet of Islam responded with patience and forgiveness. He imbibed Allah's attribute of Al-Halim, the forbearing one. 
In one instance, while he was in the middle of prayers, a group of enemies grabbed him, locked a mantle around his neck, dragged him across the ground. The chokehold, it, it was said, was so tight that his eyes began to protrude. Yet he continued saying the name of Allah, and he never swore revenge. In another instance, while in prostration during prayers, another group of enemies laid the entrails of a camel on his back, enough to weigh him down, to keep him from rising. Yet he ignored such cruelty. He forgave his enemies. He would consistently forgive those who would exhibit unspeakable cruelties to his close companions, his family members, people that he saw murdered in front of his eyes. For example, soon after the Prophet Muhammad had migrated to Medina, he had longed for the company of his daughter, Hazrat Zainab Raziyatala Anha. After arrangements were made for Hazrat Zainab to leave Mecca, she mounted a camel and began her journey to Medina to see the Prophet. But the Quraysh sent a party to stop her and Hazrat Zainab's own cousin, Habar bin Aswad, was a member of this party. And when Zainab came into Habar's view, he flung a spear at her, causing her to fall from the camel and suffer a miscarriage. And she eventually succumbed and passed away from the same injuries. Years later, at the fall of Mecca, Habar was among those few people whom the Prophet of Islam had declared would be executed for his crimes. But Habar came to the Prophet of Islam and said, O oh, Prophet of God, I ran far away from you, but the thought came to me that God had rid us of our pagan beliefs and saved us from spiritual death. Instead of going to others and seeking shelter with them, why not go to the Prophet himself, acknowledge my faults and my sins, and ask for his forgiveness? And the Prophet, upon hearing this, replied, Habar, if God has planted the love of Islam in your heart, how can I refuse to forgive you? I forgive everything you have done before this. He forgave the very person who murdered his daughter. This was his unyielding desire to mend deep divisions and rivalries in Arabia and to soften the hearts of even the most hardened enemies of Islam. He healed a fractured society through sublime acts of forgiveness and this my dear brothers and sisters, provides a profound lesson for all American Muslims and indeed people of all faith and all cultural traditions. And that is, we must have the courage to forgive if we are to heal as our nation. The founder of our community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, whom we claim to be the promised Messiah, came to revive Islam's teachings and revitalize these very examples of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A few months ago, we completed the historic centennial of our community in America, a full 100 years since the first Ahmadi Muslim missionary arrived in Philadelphia. And to mark that occasion, our community took a full page ad in the New York Times, in which we showcased the words of healing of our founder, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. And I would like to end with those words. This appeared in the New York Times, and I quote, believe in God as one without associate and have sympathy with God's creatures and be of good conduct and think no ill, be such that no disorderliness or mischief should approach your heart, utter no falsehood, invent no lies and cause no hurt to anyone, whether by your tongue or your hands. Avoid all manner of sin and restrain your passions. Try to become pure hearted without vice. It should be your principle to have sympathy for all human beings. I hope and pray that Allah enables all of us to reflect on these profound words. May we work tireless, tirelessly as brothers and sisters of all faiths, shoulder to sh shoulder to shoulder, as one to heal this great nation of ours. May Allah enable us to do so, inshallah, ameen.